On September 17, 2011, Occupy Wall Street began in New York City's Wall Street Financial District. The main reason for these protests were the inequality and unsustainable nature of wealth distribution in the U.S. This chapter explores how the U.S. government defines poverty, the balance between assisting the poor without discouraging work, and how federal anti-poverty programs work. It also discusses income inequality, how economists measure inequality, why inequality has changed in recent decades, and the range of possible government policies to reduce inequality, and the danger of a trade-off that too great a reduction in inequality may reduce incentives for producing output. The definition of poverty in the U.S. was originally created in 1963 by a government worker called Molly Orshansky. She established a line or level of funds needed in order to provide a nutritionally adequate diet to a family who spends one-third of its total income on this diet, the other two-thirds going to other needs like housing. This poverty level has been adjusted over time for inflation. The poverty rate is the percent of the population that falls below this income level divided by the total population. This table compares the U.S. poverty rate over time. The poverty rate fell dramatically during the 1960s, rose in the early 1980s and early 1990s, and after declining in the 90s through mid-2000s, rose to 15.9% in 2011, which is close to the 1960 levels. In 2012, the poverty rate dropped slightly to 15%. The poverty line or level in 2017 for a single person was $12,060 and $24,600 for a family of four. Assisting those who fall below the poverty level is often seen as beneficial to those receiving assistance. How can this assistance be bad or at least counterproductive? Economists use the term poverty trap to explain how recipients of aid are trapped in poverty because they have the potential to lose assistance as they gain earned income, dollar for dollar. They have to make a choice concerning the trade-off of spending more time working to earn income or to not work and keep their assistance. It is basically a trap based off the trade-off between labor and leisure. The poor only have so much time to budget. The question is, how to spend it to get the most from it. Here is an example of this in this graph. The original choice is 500 hours of leisure, 2,000 hours of work at point A. The income is going to be $16,000. With a guaranteed income of $18,000, this family would receive $18,000 whether it provides zero hours of work or 2,000 hours of work. Only if the family provides, say, 2,300 hours of work does its income rise above the guaranteed level of 18,000. And even then, the marginal gain to income from working many hours is small. There is a way to loosen the grip of the poverty trap, and that is to lessen assistance at a lower marginal rate than marginal income earned. That way, work actually will increase the person's standard of living in every case as soon as they begin earning more money through work. Here is an example of how this works. On the original labor leisure opportunity set, the lower budget set shown by the smaller dash line in the figure, the preferred choice P is 500 hours of leisure and $16,000 of income. Then the government created an anti-poverty program that guarantees $18,000 in income even to those who work zero hours, shown by the larger dash line. In addition, every dollar earned means phasing out only 50 cents of benefits. This program leads to the higher budget set shown in the diagram. The hope is that this program will provide incentives to work the same or more hours despite receiving income assistance. However, it is possible that the recipients will choose a point on the new budget set like S with less work, more leisure, and greater income, or a point like R with the same work and a greater income. The government has many programs to help those in poverty 
and those who suddenly find themselves without a job or income. This is often called the safety net. One of the major current programs is the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families Program, or TANF. This program is based on income level and family size, and is also adjusted by states for cost of living differences. Another major program is the Earned Income Tax Credit, or the EITC. This is specifically geared to help poor out of, poverty, out of the poverty trap by giving extra income to the working poor. This is one of the most highly funded programs in the safety net. Another tax credit, which is designed to help the poor, is the Child Tax Credit, which gives funds per supported child. Here is a graph showing the funding levels of these programs over time. The earned income tax credit increased from more than $20 billion in 2000 to over an estimated $50 billion in 2013, far exceeding estimated 2013 outlays in the child tax credit and TANF of over $20 billion and $10 billion respectively. Some government programs are designed to assist the poor with specific needs. Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, often called food stamps, is a federally funded program that provides funds to buy nutritional food. Another program geared towards assisting the, with affordable housing is the HUD program. Medicaid is a program designed to aid the poor obtain needed health care services. Here is a graph showing the funding levels of these programs. Total expenditures on income security uh, continued to rise between 1988 and 2010, while payments for TANF have increased from $13 billion in 1998 to an estimated $17.3 billion in 2013. SNAP has seen relatively small increments. These two programs comprise a relatively small portion of the estimated $106 billion dedicated to income security in 2013. Note that other programs and housing programs increased dramatically during the 2008 and 2010 time periods. Here is an interesting set of graphs that gives some insight into the Medicaid program. Part A on the left shows the Medicaid enrollment by different populations with young children comprising the largest percentage at 47%, followed by adults at 28%, and the blind and disabled at 16%. Part B on the right shows that Medicaid spending is principally for the blind and disabled, followed by the elderly. Although children are the largest population covered by Medicaid, expenditures on children are only 21%. Income inequality is a relative matter depending on where you live and what your income level is. A person who is considered rich in the country of Uruguay may not be considered so in Sweden. One of the ways to look at income inequality is to divide individuals by their income levels into quintiles or fifths. We can see a visual version of this analysis by looking at this graph. The curve below the dotted line is called a Lorenz curve. A Lorenz curve graphs the cumulative shares of income received by everyone up to a certain quintile. The income distribution in 1980 was closer to the perfect inequality line, shown here by the dotted 45 degree line, than the income distribution in 2011. That is, the US income distribution became more unequal over time. The changing of the composition of the US household and a shift in the distribution of wages are two main causes for income inequality shifts in the United States. Changes in household composition include the rise in two earner households and a rise also in single parent households. The shift in wages can be analyzed using the market for highly skilled labor. The portion of workers attending college has increased in re recent decades. So the supply curve for highly skilled labor has shifted to the right from SO to S1. If the demand for high skilled labor had remained at DO, then this shift uh, in supply would have led to lower wages for high skilled labor. However, the wages for high skilled labor, especially if there is a large global demand, have increased even with the shift in supply to the right. The explanation must lie in a shift to the right in demand for high skilled labor from DO to D1. The figure shows how a combination of the shift in supply from SO to S1 
and the shift in demand from DO to D1 led to both an increase in the quantity of high-skilled labor hired and also to a rise in the wage for such labor from WO to W1. Can any society expect complete equality in income or wealth? Income being the inflow of money and wealth being the accumulation of valuable assets from that income. To answer the previous question about equality, most certainly not. Does that mean that there cannot be efforts made to try to promote financial equality? No, it does not. And so the government takes on the role of Robin Hood and gives to the poor by taking from the rich. This redistribution takes place through taxation of the rich and in turn providing those tax funds to the poor through the safety net programs we discussed previously. The U.S. tax system works in this way because it is primarily a progressive tax system on income. That means that the rate you pay on income taxes rise as your income rises. This type of tax system has its critics mainly because it provides negative incentives for individuals to increase their income level and it provides incentives for individuals to evade taxation altogether. Society faces a trade-off where any attempt to move toward greater equality like moving from choice A to B involves a reduction in economic output. Situations can arise like point C where it is possible to both increase equality and to increase economic output to a choice like D. It may also be possible to increase equality with little impact on economic output like the movement from choice D to E. However, at some point too aggressive a push for equality will tend to reduce economic output as in the shift from E to F. So it is critical for the government to use effective taxation and effective policy to deal with economic inequality. 